So we are live now. Good to go. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to each and everyone who is connected with this symposium today. And uh, first of all, I would like to say a sincere thanks to Retina World Congress because uh, they are our academic partners. And because of them, as of now, we are connected with 66 countries from where the participants have already done an advanced registration. So for that, I would like to thank Dr. Cooperman, Dr. George, Dr. Tarek, and Dr. Rishi for having this collaboration. RWC is doing a wonderful job by keeping the education alive in these tough times. And they have another program coming in next Sunday. So please do attend that. So as far as uh, today's uh, symposium is concerned, the reason behind organizing the symposium is that we have a new drug, Bralacizumab, which is a recent anti-VEGF molecule that we have. And it has been launched in 40 countries as of now. However, after its launch in United States in post uh, launch, there were some reports of intraocular inflammation, uh, including vasculitis and the vascular occlusion. So globally, retina specialists, they have a lot of questions. You know, that is shown by the questions that we have received in the advanced registration. So we will try to answer as many as the time allows. And uh, uh, we have faculty which has seen these molecules right from the beginning. So it's evolution. So I would like to involve and introduce all our faculty members who are here. So first of all, our speakers, Dr. Bendalo, who is from San Rafael, Milano, Italy. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Bendalo. Dr. Regillo from Wilsa Institute. Welcome, Dr. Regillo. And myself, Dr. Ashish, who will be the moderating this session. In case any technical issue arises, Dr. Cooper is kind enough to moderate on my behalf. And then we have Dr. Nguyen from Stanford, uh, Palo Alto, California. Welcome, Dr. Nguyen and uh, Dr. Thomas Albini, who was closely associated with all these events. Welcome, Dr. Albini. He's from Baskin Palmer Institute, University of Miami, Florida. As far as panelists are concerned, we have Dr. Enat, who would be joining a little late. That's what she has informed. She's from Israel, but as of now in New York. Dr. Cooperman from, he's my mentor, fellowship mentor from uh, Gavin Herbert Institute, University of California, Irvine. Dr. Boyer, Boyer from Retina Victor's Associate Medical Group, California. Welcome, Dr. Boyer. Dr. Mark Gillies, thank you so much for staying up for so long. You know, we would appreciate that. So Dr. Uh, Gillies ha is from University of Sydney and uh, Saving Sight Institute, I think all of us know, Australia. Dr. Ursula, am I, if I'm pronouncing your name right, apologies. And she is from University Eye Hospital, Vienna. Austria, and Dr. Vishali from uh, one of the leading institutes of India, PGI Chandigarh. So welcome each and every one. And now we would have all the talks in the beginning. We have tried to have the talks very concise, very short, so that we have a lot of time for the panel discussion here. And I would request all the speakers and the panelists to switch off your video and audio. Only the speaker who is speaking will have his uh, video or audio on. And once we start panel discussion, then everybody will have the video on. So I think without much delay, we will start with the first presentation by Dr. Francisco Bandalo. You know, we have, uh, you know, published a lot of papers on Braulis map uh, uh, with uh, his guidance in last couple of years. So he would be talking about how does the Braulis map as a molecule is different from the other anti vegf that we have been using in uh, past years. Dr. Bandala, over to so, you. Thank you so much, Ashish, for involving me in this, uh, in this event. Uh, it's a honor for me to be part of the panel. Can you go back with the slides, please? Okay, so uh, please go ahead. The, the, you know, the, the history of uh, our last uh, decades is very interesting. I, I w became a medical doctor in uh, 1980. And at that time, we started to use uh, laser uh, photocoagulation for uh, treating uh, AMD. 
But unfortunately, we had a lot of problems related to retinal scars and recurrence of uh, new vessels. Then uh, we had in the early 2000s, we started to have a new therapeutic approach, which was the photodynamic therapy. Uh, it was uh, better than uh, photocoagulation, but unfortunately, it was only able to limit the visual acuity loss. And uh, there was no uh, improvement in the great majority of our patients of visual function. From 2005, the history changed completely. And we can consider that as a, a revolution moment uh, for our, uh, for our uh, ophthalmology and for our patients. So we started to have an improvement in visual function as a consequence of our therapies. Please go ahead. The next, please. So uh, vascular endothelial growth factor was recognized as one of the most important driver for uh, neovascularization um, by a lot of uh, researchers. One of them was Napoleone Ferrara. I like to remember him because he's uh, an Italian one and from south of Italy. And he was able to show the importance of vascular endothelial growth factor. And he was mainly able to uh, to, to, to uh, invent a way to stop the uh, activity of vascular endothelial factor using some kind of uh, um, antibody, which was able to, to link vascular endothelial growth factor, limiting the effect of these uh, elements. For sure, vascular endothelial growth factor is some physiologic element inside human body. So uh, it is only uh, an increase of vascular endothelial growth factor that we must try to stop in order to uh, uh, stop the evolution of uh, many uh, retinal diseases. Next one. So we have today um, different, uh, different uh, effects from uh, the anti-DGF uh, therapy. One is that we are able, please go, go back, sorry. Uh, one is, um, please go back once. Okay, one is to, to uh, stop the stimulation of endothelial cells, which is the first effect of vascular endothelial growth factor. But we are also able to stop the migration of microphages and to uh, limit the increase of vascular permeability, which is one of the consequences of vascular endothelial growth factor effect. And finally, we are able to stop the blood retinal barrier breakdown, which is one of the most important effects of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. Next. We have different uh, molecules uh, which are able to produce these, uh, these effects. Uh, the first one was uh, pegaptani. I, I think everyone remember uh, the macugen, uh, which was the first anti-DGF therapy we are we able to use. And uh, one of the main uh, peculiarity of uh, pegaptani was to stop only one isoform of vascular endothelial factor, which was the 165, which is one of the most important uh, isoforms of vascular endothelial growth factor, which is increased during many uh, vascular uh, diseases. Then we have bevacizumab, which is an entire uh, antibody. And, uh, uh, you know, this is not registered for any intraocular use, but uh, it is uh, an off-label drug uh, used in many places uh, as an alternative to the uh, more expensive uh, anti-DGF registered for intraocular use. Then you see ranibizumab, which is uh, only a fragment of the an entire antibody, a flipercept, uh, which is a different kind of, uh, of molecule, uh, prolucizumab, farisimab, and abisipar. The next, please. So uh, we try now to see each one of these antibody and we try to understand which is the main difference for a uh, brolucizumab. Bevacizumab is an entire, a full uh, immunoglobin, so an entire uh, molecule. Uh, the uh, molecular weight is very high, it's 149 kilodaltons, and we need 1.25 uh, milligram as a therapeutic uh, uh, dose. 
uh, it is for off-label use, as I was saying before. Ranibizumab is a fragment of the antibody. The molecular weight is one third compared with the previous one, and the clinical dose is uh, 0.5 milligram. It is able to neutralize uh, uh, soluble splice variants and the proteolytic fragments of vascular endothelial growth factor A. The next, please. A flibercept is a bit different. It's a fusion protein. So it's not only a, a, a fragment of an antibody, it's a chimeric molecule carrying soluble for receptors, VGF uh, R1, 2, and linked to a, an a FC fragment of human immunoglobin 1, and it's able to prevent the vascular endothelial growth factor action. Pegactabib, as I was saying before, is uh, uh, able to act against only the isoform one, uh, 165, A165 of vascular factor, and it's able to prevent the binding of uh, vascular endothelial factor with the receptor one. The next, please. Farizimab. So this is the, the new one that we are going to, to present today. And uh, sorry, <laughs> Farizimab is uh, um, a, a new kind of uh, therapy proposed by Roche recently, and it is uh, characterized by two uh, different uh, uh, effects. It is able to stop angiopoietin 2 and stabilizes and protects the, the vessels and uh, is also an anti-VGFA uh, um, fragment, which is able to inhibit the vascular leakage and new vessels uh, coming uh, as a consequence of vascular endothelial growth factor. Abisipar, unfortunately, uh, as you know very well, was stopped recently. It was a very small, a very uh, a small molecule, which was able to bind uh, vascular endothelial growth factor A with a very high affinity and specificity. The next, please. So finally, bronzizumab, uh, which one is the, the, the molecule we are going to discuss today. It is only a very small uh, molecule with a molecular weight of 26 kilodalton. The clinical dose is six milligram, and it's able to bind all the isoforms of vascular endothelial growth factor A. Uh, so a very small molecule with a better tissue penetrance. These are the two main important, most important characteristics of uh, this new drug. Please go ahead. So um, if you wanna say which are the, uh, the most important uh, characteristics of this drug, we must remember there is uh, an absence of the uh, uh, FC, the, the region of the uh, antibody. So uh, this part of the antibody is able to bind multiple receptors involved in immune cell activation. And as a consequence of this, of that, it could be responsible for uh, a cellular uh, cytotoxicity, which is absolutely absent with the brolucizumab. With reference to safety, uh, Ashish was introducing the topic, which maybe is the most important today of uh, safety, but theoretically, these characteristics of uh, brolucizumab should allow a better safety compared with the other. So um, with the reference to the, the other uh, characteristic positive aspects of brolucizumab, uh, one is the longer intravitreal life and the other one is the easier uh, manufacturing process. Next, please. So in conclusion, brolucizumab uh, seems to provide some advantage compared with the other uh, uh, drugs available today. Uh, the lower dosing frequency, in fact, in the Oak and Aria trials, 56% uh, of the uh, patients treated uh, with uh, uh, the drug in the Oak and 51 in the Aria um, maintained a 12 week dosing interval in the year one, 12 week means uh, uh, three months. And uh, among these patients, 82 in the oak and 75 in the area maintained 12 weeks. So um, uh, dosing interval in the year two. So we have a drug which seems absolutely uh, most uh, effective, 
uh, with uh, theoretically fewer, fewer side effects and maybe also with uh, a, re a reduction in the cost for manufacturing. So uh, looking at these aspects of the drug, I think we have a lot of positive uh, points that, that we must consider and uh, we will discuss all the other aspects uh, in the next uh, presentations. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bandalo, for your talk. And uh, now I would invite uh, Dr. So let me just stop share first. And then Dr. B uh, Rajillo will have his talk on uh, brolicizumab and fluid, that how the brolicizumab you know, has its impact on the fluid. Very good, Techn thank you. Technical team, if could you please stop share on my behalf? While we get my slide deck up, I'll, uh, just, I'll say. I think we need to just stop share here. Excellent. Doesn't look like I'm quite ready to share yet. Yeah, I think. I think now I've stopped sharing. I think now you should be okay. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Please, over to you. Very good. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this symposium. It's a distinct uh, honor and pleasure. Uh, my talk is about brolicizumab and fluid in the setting of treating neovascular AMD. I'll be presenting really all the latest data from the Hawk and Harrier phase three studies uh, out to the 96 week uh, endpoint. Here are my financial disclosures. You're now familiar with the phase three Hawk and Harrier study designs, a two year identical loading phase of three monthly doses at first, followed by a flibercep dosed every eight weeks thereafter during the maintenance phase and brolicizumab dosed every 12 weeks unless there was disease activity per protocol at specified time points in the study with the treatment interval then reduced to every eight weeks in a fixed fashion going forward for the remainder of the study. Both studies met the primary endpoint of non-inferiority in BCVA of brolicizumab versus a flibercept with greater than 50% of brolicizumab six milligram dose patients being maintained exclusively every 12 weeks um, after that load out to week 48. And anatomically uh, by OCT, as you see here, uh, brolicizumab achieved statistically superior statistically significantly superior mean reductions in CST from baseline to week 16, 48, and out to 96. So these primary anatomic endpoints of CST that favored brolicizumab prompted addition analyses of the data from the pivotal studies. The rationale is as follows. Sustained drying the macula is a good indicator uh, of disease control, which could translate into improved long-term visual outcomes in addition to reduced burden. So this analysis was performed to evaluate the time and number of injections needed to achieve sustained macular dryness of brolicizumab versus aflibercept in these phase three trials. Specifically, we looked at the 96 week outcomes of one time to achieve sustained dryness defined as three or more consecutive fluid-free intervals at both 50th and 75th percentiles. Number two, the number of injections uh, to achieve sustained dryness at these two percentiles. And number three, the cumulative incident rates of sustained dryness at week 96. So here are the 50th percentile sustained dryness results from Hawk, which showed that sustained dryness was achieved faster with bolicizumab versus a flibercept until week 96. The differences favoring both doses with brolicizumab started early during the match phase and continued in the maintenance phase um, out through uh, week 96. The 50th percentile was achieved by week eight for both three and six milligrams of brolicizumab versus week 12 for a flibercept um, with about the same weighted mean number of injections up to this point. For the 75th percentile on Hawk, the differences between the drugs were larger. Uh, both in time and number of injections. Here it was 32 weeks with a mean of 3.3 injections for six milligrams bolicizumab, 36 weeks 
with a mean of 3.7 injections with three milligrams bolizumab, uh, indicative of a dose response. And that's versus 56 weeks with a mean of 5.4 injections with a flibercept. The results were similar for Harrier. Again, faster, greater degrees of dryness, with the 50th percentile for sustained dryness reached by week four for bolucizumab, week eight for a flibercept. And for the 75th percentile in Harrier, like Hawk, uh, the bolucizumab arm showed faster drying with fewer injections. 75th percentile for sustained dryness was achieved by week 20 uh, with a mean of 2.6 injections for bolucizumab versus 52 weeks with a mean of 4.4 injections for uh, a flibercept. For the cumulative incidence of sustained dryness, it was statistically significantly higher with bolucizumab compared to a flibercept in both studies with a lower total mean number of treatments with bolucizumab as shown. Here's a case example of mine uh, in practice. You can see the patient was well-maintained with good dryness and good visual acuity 2040 with ranibizumab at four week intervals. Um, but even with an attempt to extend to five weeks, you see the drop in vision and a lot of intraretinal fluid accumulation. Uh, but with bolucizumab, we switched over and even out through week six, an extra two weeks of durability can be seen back to good visual acuity 2040 with minimal uh, edema. So better control and um, more durable for sure um, by a couple of weeks in this particular case. Some additional analyses were performed to date that mirrored the CAT and Ivan. Uh, these two independent studies in which there was an analysis to investigate whether visual outcomes in eyes with neovasc or AMD were influenced by fluctuations in retinal thickness. An identical analysis was performed in the Hawk and Harrier data using the same CST fluctuation quartile definitions. And it showed identical results. Hawk and Harrier to the left, CAT and Ivan to the right, increased variability in CST was associated with worse BCVA. And here, the data in graphic form uh, for Hawk and Harrier, uh, we see um, quartiles out through 96 weeks over the course, more stable CST. Um, better disease control is really what that implies is associated with the better visual outcomes. And as you would likely predict, um, patients with less CST variability had fewer visits with any fluid after the load. That is, stable CST is associated with a dry macula. Uh, what about safety from Hawk and Harrier? Well, when you look at it uh, in gross terms here with adverse events, serious adverse events, both non-ocular and ocular, you see that overall the, the drug was relatively well tolerated with uh, a safety profile that was actually comparable among the three arms. Similar rates of three or more lines of vision loss, for example, at seven to 8% across these uh, study results. However, a deeper dive into the ocular safety profile did show an imbalance of intraocular inflammation and retinal vascular occlusions being higher with bolucizumab compared to aflibercept in both studies. We're gonna be hearing um, quite a bit more about ocular inflammation with anti-VEGFs and the two talks to follow by Drs. Noyan and Albini. So in summary, these post-talk analyses showed that brolicizumab had faster and statistically higher rates of complete sustained drying in both studies. And this was achieved with fewer doses compared to flibercept, suggesting better disease control with brolicizumab and nevasca AMD with the potential for reduced treatment burden. And anecdotally, we're now starting to see that with the use of the drug in practice. But this is being put to the test in terms of exactly how much more durable this drug is compared to a flibercept in this ongoing phase three Talon study with identical treat and extend uh, regimens for the two drugs to look for differences in the durability of these treatment intervals. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carl, for uh, giving us uh, the insight on the fluid part. You can stop share. That should I have it? Thank you. Okay,
I'm almost ready with my slides. So I would be uh, talking about the real world experience. Here we go. Is it? So uh, my topic is uh, what kind of real world experience that uh, we had in the in the published literature. So to be uh, to be true, uh, we do not have really published data, large data on the real world experience. So I would be sharing, you know, what we published uh, as a group, as a brief study, and another study which was a short a case series, consecutive case series. Uh, so in a just in a minute, these are my disclosures. So as I mentioned, we have couple of studies. This first one uh, was published by us and I would like to thank all the four is, uh, institutes from United States who have contributed their data and helped us in publication of this largest series as on today. And there's another one which was published by Gelmore et al by their group. This was uh, around six cases. So first of all, I would share what were the outcomes in the brief study. We had around 42 patients with 60 injections given. Mean age was 79.2 with a standard deviation of seven years. And we had around 57.2% females in that particular group. And we had follow-up of 7.2 to uh, 3.6 standard deviation weeks. And uh, all the eyes were previously treated either with bevacizumab or ranibizumab or aflibercept. That's where this real world data was different from the Hawk and Harrier. Hawk and Harrier, we had all the treatment naive patients. And the mean number of uh, previous anti of injections were 19 and the range was three to 107. As far as number of injections per patient was, uh, we had most of the patients who received uh, one injection and uh, very few received four injections. And if we talk about the visual equity analysis at baseline and the follow-up, if you compare, there was no statistically difference in uh, this group. Probably reason behind is because these were all the cases who were resistant with the other drugs. However, if you look at the data at the central subfield thickness, there was definite uh, a reduction was seen statistically significant. We had seen drying of both IRF and uh, SRF. And this is a representative case of our publication. So if you look at the top uh, picture that, uh, that shows sub-retinal fluid and the sub-RPE fluid, which uh, was still persisting after four aflibercept injection, but after one injection of brolicizumab, it just uh, dries up. As far as safety was concerned, we did not find any signs of intraocular inflammation, vascularis or vascular occlusion. However, we would not say that that is a true sample size to really find out that because it's a quite a small to find out that a small incidence of those adverse events. This is another study which I was mentioning. They had six eyes and six injections. Follow-up uh, was four weeks and all live eyes were previously treated either with bevacizumab or aflibercept. All improved IRF, SRF, central macular thickness was better and average pericentral thickness was also better. And they also did not find any kind of inflammation or adverse events. So we have really little data on the real world. So I do not have anything else to show you as far as the real world data is concerned. I think we would have a lot of points in the discussion, although in terms of the real world. Thank you so much and stay safe. Now I would invite uh, Dr. Uh, Nguyen to really highlight an important aspect, uh, which is the inflammation part. And he would be talking to us that how is the inflammation with not only Brolis's map, but with the overall anti-VEGF molecules. Dr. Nguyen, over to you, please. Okay. I am sharing. Are we able to see my slide? Yes, very much. I think if you can 
or just for full screen? Uh, it should be in full screen now. Uh, it's not in full screen yet, is that right? Or Yeah, I think so. Can technical team help, please? Uh, you're in the wrong view. We can see your subsequent slide. If you go up to the upper left, you can show can change the view. Now, let's see. Okay. Uh, display Two. setting. Yeah. Um, no, let's see. I think if you Somewhere you can get out of this mode and into just the single big slide. Yes, let's try it again. And also, I don't see your camera. I'm not sure it's on, so we can't see you. OK, let's see. Um, just get the out of it, OK. Meanwhile, Dr. Anat is here. Welcome, Dr. Anat. Yeah. Hi, sorry. I was just in another meeting. Hi, <laughs> Anat. I hope. Hi, good morning. Good morning. How about now? Good, Perfect. wonderful. So we can't see, if you could turn on your camera, Kwan, we can't see you. Uh, that's not so important, but that's the... Uh, <laughs> that's a beautiful see. family. Hi, Diana. <laughs> I, it would be nice if you turn on your camera while you're talking. That'd be awesome. I do. Let's see. It is on. Let's just join. Let me try. Let's keep the talk first, and then I'll try to see where. OK, we have enough time to see you in panel discussion. Yes. yes. Uh, so certainly, uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma, for this very kind invitation to this very uh, wonderful global symposium here. I'm going to start my presentation by asking an important question, and that is, should we be concerned about inflammation associated with anti-VEGF therapy? My disclosure are listed here. Since the arrival of different anti-VEGF therapy that Dr. Bandello and Dr. Rogelio has covered so nicely thus far, our patient and we at the clinician scientists have enjoyed and valued the tremendous success of VEGF antagonists in preserving and gaining vision for our patient with various retinal vascular diseases. However, we have also learned about this VEGF antagonist can and at time cause intraocular inflammation, whether they are ranibizumab, aflipocept, bevisizumab, prolusizumab, or a piece of bar. Inflammation associated with anti regf therapy is often an inflammation with delay onset that can be of two different types, either of type three hypersensitive re reaction in which the primary aspect is the humoral antibody dependent, or it can also be the type four hypersensitive re reaction in which cellular mechanism is the principle. In the circumstances, one can also see the combination of different type three and four together. The primary ocular adverse events associated with clinical trial with ranibizumab is ocular inflammation. Throughout the years, we have been using ranibizumab, and in the literature, the frequency of ocular inflammation or presumed anophthalmitis is estimated to be between 0 and 12.7% based on the cross-references of different aspects. Thus far, there have been no report cases of occlusive retinal vasculopathy. What about a flipocept? In a large study by Eric Sway and his colleague from France of over 400,000 injection claim published, ocular inflammation was more frequent following individual injection of a flipocept than with ranibizumab during routine clinical use in patients with neovascular AMD. Again, however, there was no significant occlusive vasculitis that had been reported. In March 2020, shortly after the Macular Society Congress, 
this translational science review of ophthalmology was among the very first to report that there were six cases of retinal artery occlusion, retinal artery thrombosis, retinal artery occlusion, and retinal artery embolism in map and one case of retinal artery occlusion in a flipacep in the Hawk and Hellyer trial that Dr. Regello nicely covered. Subsequently, a few weeks later, Dr. Sarah Holt and Dr. Hien Don, among other colleagues, published this first case of occlusive vasculitis in a peer-reviewed journal in the world. A few days later, the second case of retinal arterial occlusion by Dr. Atul Jain and colleague was also published, subsequently indicating or illustrating the type of inflammation that one may see with treatment of prolososomab. What about apisobol? In the recent study, it has been shown that the incidence of intraocular inflammation were about 15.4% and 15.3% in the apisobol group versus 0.3% in the control group. What are the potential role of anti-drug antibody? In other words, how did this inflammation occur? There have been discussion of the potential role of anti-drug antibody in causing intraocular inflammation and vaso occlusion disease. ADA or anti-drug antibody when bound to a soluble antigen, just as the drug molecule may form a deposit along the vessel and cause occlusive vasculitis. Therefore, deposit which appear phenotypically similar to immune complexes aggregate that one can see in a type 3 reaction. Because of this, there may be significant role of ADA in this delayed hypersensitivity reaction. How should one manage ocular inflammation associated with anti vaginal therapy? And this will be a major point of discussion that we will have. Beyond first and foremost, one should look for the evaluation to rule out other causes that may lead to the inflammation. Subsequently, once we have established that the inflammation has occurred, one should treat it very aggressively in order to halt the progression. In the case that Sarah Holt, Hindon, and other has reported, one has used even intraocular delivery of steroid, a sustained release device in order to control it. One can say safely that in treating patients with ocular inflammation that of this level of retinal vasculitis and vaso occlusive disease, one needs to be as aggressive as possible in order to preserve any vision for the patient. The American Society of Retinal Specialists recommends not to inject the anti vegf agent that caused the inflammation or any other anti vegf agent until inflammation has resolved. However, an important question remains, when can one re-inject with another anti vegf agent? Is it one week later? Is it one month later? Thus far, we don't have very clear data. Another important question be, how certain we are about the safety and recurrence of ocular inflammation with the similar or other type of anti vegf therapy. Therefore, in summary, we have used the last few minutes to discuss about inflammation associated with anti vegf therapy. And one needs to recognize that it is a reality. Innate immunity of the eye toward an agent associated with molecule versus anti drug antibodies are among the concepts that we have taught. Type 3 and type 4 hypersensitive reaction versus combination seem to be the potential mechanism of action for this aspect. As clinician scientists, we should manage each case of ocular inflammation properly and seriously and monitor carefully for progressions. Consideration of risk and benefit, including inflammation and its management as we would toward bringing new therapy to patients. And certainly with that, we look for guidance and collaboration with regulatory bodies, such as the various agencies ac across the world, with various society, and with our colleagues, such as those on the uh, symposium today. With that, I thank you everyone for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nguyen, for and highlighting all the aspects of inflammation with the uh, uh, 
not only brolicizumab, but with the other anti-VEGFs also. If you could stop sharing your screen. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you. Stop sharing. Now we have come to the uh, last but very important talk, which is the difference from all the other anti-VEGFs. The drug has been seen as a causing vasculitis and Dr. Albini, who has been very closely associated with all the events. And uh, in fact, he was a part of the SRC, if I'm not wrong. So uh, I think he would uh, enlighten us about the vasculitis and how the brolicizumab map can fit in with these kind of safety signals. Over to you, Dr. Albini. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure you guys see the screen in full screen mode and you can hear me. Can you, we you see you, but we're, we're seeing the sidebar. It's not full screen mode. Uh, okay. We're not in presentation mode yet. I have it. Let's see. How did I fix this last time? I remember. Down, I think you just go down to the bottom where you go, click on presentation mode in the lower right there of your, of your no, slide. I'm in, it's, it, it's in presentation mode in my... Oh. In we're seeing all the we're seeing a chain of slides on the left hand side. Uh, team, can you help? Annotate remote. Let's see. Tom, Tom, you may need to select the stop. Yeah. And now I'll share the screen again. Here it is, slideshow. Let's see, that yeah. should work. But you Sorry. need to share the slideshow. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. We're good. good? Yes. <laughs> You'd think that after all this Zooming, I'd be an expert at this, not yet. Um, anyway, thank you very much for including me in this symposium, and I'll try to put together the thoughts. As was mentioned, I did serve on, um, let's see if I can forward my slide. I did serve on the uh, Safety Review Committee for Novartis, and um, what I can't really capture here in its entirety, and it's important to say, is that Novartis has really put together a Herculean effort in terms of multiple uh, safety committees, uh, data, data safety monitoring committees, and um, uh, uh, think tanks that have been geared at understanding why this complication is happening, how often it's happening, um, and how to best approach it, how to treat it, and what risk factors are for it if we can identify patient populations or if there are other solutions to this problem. Um, so uh, I was a small part of that. There's uh, many people that are involved in this, um, but I did uh, serve on Data Safety Monitoring Committee. I've been a consultant for Novartis and, and I did serve on this uh, uh, and do serve on the Safety Review Committee. And there's a lot of information that's coming out um, uh, and there, there will be a lot of this uh, explained as time goes on um, with uh, new data that's being shared from all these uh, Novartis committees. Now, going back to Carl's talk, um, if you can see here, I think this is an important slide and it was buried in, in another slide that, uh, that Dr. Regillo showed. And basically, you know, the overall safety of the drug, and I think this is an important context to, to keep in mind when talking about this new adverse event with retinal vasculitis, occlusive retinal vasculitis that we're seeing with brolicizumab. The overall rate of vision loss was very well balanced between the groups. And I think although the occlusive vasculitis was not as well appreciated early on uh, as this drug gained approval and made it to market, um, it's important to understand that the rate of uh, vision loss, no matter how you cut it, greater than 15 letters, greater than 30 letters, was balanced between the aflibercept arms and the brolicizumab arms. But it was noted early on, and I think a, a number of us remember this talk at Macula Society, one of the last uh, pre-COVID um, uh, meetings that, that we had, and um, uh, where there was uh, identified that there was a higher rate of intraocular inflammation. Now, this was very well understood when the FDA approved the drug and uh, was appreciated. But what wasn't appreciated so well was that there was a subgroup of patients who had uh, retinal uh, occlusive events, arterial occlusive events, and had associated really decreased, uh, significantly decreased vision, as you can see on this uh, waterfall plot. Um, where a number of these patients, not all of them, there was a patient who gained 18 letters throughout the course of the study and had an occlusive event, 
but there were there were a number of them there that you can see on the right hand side that lost a significant amount of vision and had a, a, had occlusive events. And this was a, an image that uh, Dr. Dougal has shared with me, and it shows um, these this type of plaque like formation within the vessel with the corresponding occlusion. And if you look closely, you can you can see. Um, an, a number of these events uh, throughout the fundus of a type of um, uh, Kirillaeus-like plaque formation. Uh, for those of us in the uveitis world, a number of us like that term, like you might see in an infectious uveitis like toxoplasmosis. Um, but these could also be interpreted as embolic phenomenon or little emboli um, causing, causing occlusion. The difference was that in these cases, all of these cases also had intraocular inflammation. So they looked like they were, like they were inflammatory uh, events. And uh, this was uh, uh, one of the first publications showing um, uh, in the real world that as the drug became approved in the United States and started being used really after January 1st, um, there were quickly uh, 26 cases that were uh, reported to the ASRS uh, 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 safety committee, the rest committee, and um, and these cases were characterized as having both venous and arterial involvement. A subset of the patients seemed to have evidence of choroidal um, ischemia as well, and optic nerve um, inflammation was not uncommon um, as well. And uh, these this uh, was further worked on, and cases added and reported here in a recent publication in the Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases from the ASRS uh, that came out that uh, is a more extensive collection of, uh, of cases. This is a, a woman that I saw who had been treated by a local uh, physician in the Palm Beach area. 83-year-old woman has a cardiac history. She'd also had uh, deep venous thrombosis previously and was on, on blood thinners. And she had received multiple aflibercept injection, but remained with a significant amount of fluid, as you can see on this scan. And after her first brolicizumab injection, she dried right up, had, a, had an improvement in vision of a, of a line or two. And now she was sitting at about 2040 vision with this, this scan. And then the patient calls a few days, about six, or six days after her, uh, her second brolicizumab injection. And she reports that she's got a, a a pretty significant decrease in vision. When she comes in, we see that she has these uh, these plaque-like formations. I don't know if you can see my my uh, my <clears throat> cursor here, but you can see here these vessels that they're they're sheathing of these vessels. And if you look around, you can see more inflammation than a number of the other the other vessels. The OCT still looks good, but you can see on the OCT that there's not as good of a signal going through the vitreous here. And there's a, there's a suggestion here of maybe some sort of infiltrative process here on the surface of the retina. Difficult to really call, but um, from other cases that I've seen, I look out for these things now, any evidence of any sort of cellular activity within the vitreous, it may uh, suggest an inflammatory process going on that could otherwise be missed. And in fact, this was interpreted by the treating physician as embolic phenomenon because this patient did have a history of of um, of, uh, uh, pro, of coagulatory uh, coagulopathy and and um, and DVT, as I had said before, um, and uh, this is the end, a late frame angiogram that shows some influ that shows some uh, staining of the disc there. But when I came in and saw her, it was obvious that she had a pretty um, uh, uh, significant vitritis in the right eye. This was the eye that was involved and this was the, the other eye. Um, so that um, careful uh, examination for cellular activity in the anterior chamber and in the, in the vitreous is paramount, I think, in following these patients to pick up these inflammatory events. And of course, wide field fluorescein angiography is absolutely essential at making uh, this diagnosis. Dr. Carolyn Baumel uh, had a similar case that I'll show you the images for in a second. And she put together a series very quickly just after uh, uh, Dr. Wynn's series that he showed. Uh, in the last talk, this came out a, a, about a month later um, of uh, 15 eyes and 12 patients from multiple centers that have, that have had uh, similar uh, events with uh, 
uh, not all patients had severe vision loss, but the but the uh, the mean vision loss went from 2050 to about 2200 in these patients. And the overall clinical uh, findings in these patients were vitreous cells, anterior chamber cells, um, keratic precipitates, corneal edema, retinal arterial narr narrowing, this curileus plaques and, and embolic like looking phenomenon, clinical signs of retinal ischemia, including PAM on, on OCT, intraretinal hemorrhages in some patients, and um, dilation, narrowing, AV vicking, phlebitis, and so on of retinal veins. And again, optic nerve leakage on fluorescein angiography was very, uh, was very commonly seen. This is uh, Carolyn Baumel's case. Um, showed, again, a significant improvement with the brolicizumab, uh, but then these multiple areas of occlusive uh, vasculopathy, or what we think is vasculitis. I think we can call it vasculitis now. And this is another patient who had a more hemorrhagic uh, pre presentation, uh, as is uh, seen in HORV. Uh, it was, you know, wondered if there was a common pathophysiology here with hemorrhagic occlusive uh, retinal vasculitis seen after antibiotic injections. Um, and um, uh, that's another a variant that you can see. Novartis started the, the uh, safety review committee. And among the things we did on this committee was go through the Hawk and Harrier cases and look at them uh, each case by case of all the patients that had intraocular inflammation to look for um, vasculitis. And the numbers that, we've, that we found here I'll draw your attention to um, uh, the overall risk of developing intraocular inflammation, vasculitis or retinal vascular occlusion, um, about 2.1%. And then to have that with greater than 30 uh, letters of vision loss, which is really, I think, what we're all most fearful of is about 0.5%. So one in 200 patients have intraocular inflammation, some sort of retinal occlusive event, and loss of vision of 30 letters. Um, and uh, that's, you know, one in 200, not an insignificant number. So as a, so, as in summary, uh, the, in Hawk and Harrier, about one in 200 patients in the brolicizumab arms developed IOI, occlusive retinal vasculitis and severe vision loss. Treatment naive patients developed IOI at any uh, point in the first 18 months of, of exposure. Um, in some cases, patients with severe vision loss had pre-existing signs of inflammation that were identified on imaging studies when we went through them and looked back at um, OCTs. There were signs of, of, uh, vascul of, uh, of vitritis that were seen uh, prior to the development of the full-blown occlusive event. And there were also um, sometimes uh, uh, evidence of, of retinal vascular leakage on fluorescein angiograms before the full event happened. It may be that vision uh, loss related to occlusive retinal vasculitis was balanced by the benefit of brolicizumab, and that's why the overall rates in the study of vision loss equal out, even though we have this new event, which we did not see in the aflibercept arm. And we went through the aflibercept cases as well on the SRC and did not find uh, these type of occlusive events in the, in the aflibercept arm. So what's the overall way to think about this, the overall risk-benefit ratio? We've heard all of the benefits of this wonderful addition to our armamentarium, decreased injection frequency, better OCT outcomes uh, uh, with uh, non-inferiority and outcomes to uh, more, more frequent aflibercept ejection. But we do have to take into consideration and, and, and probably inform the patients of the risk of this one in 200 risk of severe vision loss from a complication that we have not seen anywhere near as frequently. I'm not gonna say zero, but almost zero with, with the Flibercept. And with that, I'm gonna leave it and I think we can, we can open it up for discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Albany, for uh, highlighting all the points about uh, the vasculitis. I think now I would request uh, all the speakers and the panelists, uh, we can have everybody on the video. And if Dr. Albini can stop sharing his screen, that would be great. Thank you. So uh, my first question to Dr. Is Ursula, Dr. Ursula, yes. Dr. Ursula and Dr. Gillies. So given the safety signals that we have now, you know, what kind of patients you, know, you would think that you would like to give Brolicism map at this point? 
first Dr. Ursula. So we can clearly confirm that this is a very efficient substance. And the reasons for that may be the size of the molecule, but also that, of course, a much higher concentration is loaded into each individual eye. So the molecule is much smaller, only 26 kilodalton, yet the dose is six milligram. So you can do the mass and you will immediately understand that there are a lot of molecules floating around in the eye. That has an effect. And if you measure fluid and what we do using our fluid algorithms is that we can measure intraretinal, subretinal and sub-RPE fluid separately. So this is more precise than central subfield sickness. And clearly this drug takes care of any type of fluid in a significantly more intensive way than the other substances. So eyes that need this intensive therapy would certainly benefit. The other point is that you have to make up your mind as a clinician immediately because the Bruce study showed that if you change to BOVU only later, the only morphology will improve and not vision. So either you go ahead immediately, otherwise the chances for vision improvement are lost. So you mean to say uh, that you can use it in the treatment naive patient also? I think if you want to have this as an option, you should do it immediately or forget about it. And that is a tough decision, particularly if you think of second eyes, where uh, any risk of losing vision forever is too high. So probably I would try it in first eye involvement. Thank and you. I would do it only in patients that have a lot of subretinal and sub RPE fluid. Thank you. The same question goes to Dr. Gillies. You're, you're you are muted, muted. Mark, you're muted. I think there's a role for this substance. Um, I would not use it in someone who had poor vision in the other eye. So they'd have to have good vision in the other eye. But someone who had chronic intraretinal fluid on maximal treatment, whatever that would be. So four weekly, certainly I think there's a benefit there. I think patients who are controlled on four weekly but cannot extend, uh, then uh, you might consider it there. And it might have particular uh, relevance in a country like India, for example, or places where users pay and want to reduce <clears throat> the amount of uh, drug that they receive. The difficulty I have is uh, explaining this to patients. And I tell them that there are other risks which occur with a similar frequency, a rip through the fovea or a big hemorrhage when the vessel contracts when you first start treating it. But we don't tell them about that. Um, but we do tell them about this one because it doesn't occur with the other drugs and they have to accept that. But the chance of this occurring is low. I say one in 200. And the chance of a good long-term result with chronic intraretinal fluid is uh, is probably less than 50 percent. So um, I wouldn't start out with it necessarily, but I would reserve it for cases who had chronic intraretinal fluid on four weekly treatment or a regimen that they could manage. Thank you so much, Dr. Gillies. And my next question is to Dr. Bandalo. But Dr. Bandalo, if you want to give or offer this drug, how do you counsel these patients? How do you know? What do you talk to them? Uh, I, I had no chance to use Bovu till now, so I cannot uh, speak about my own experience. What uh, I say always, whenever I use some drug which is uh, associated with some risk, is I try to explain everything. I try to, to say all the possible information to my patients in order to avoid that they can be uh, unhappy whenever something can happen. I, I think that everybody here is very uh, is convinced that this is a new, very effective and maybe efficacious drug. Uh, unfortunately, the safety aspect is important. I think that until we have a study made on a great number of patients where the number of complications is well uh, measured, 
uh, it will be difficult to decide what to do. And uh, I, I think it should be an interest also for the company to, to make this kind of uh, information available for everybody. So I strongly encourage everybody to, to push in the direction of a study where there is a register for patients treated with perlocizumab which uh, allows everyone to be informed, exactly informed about what is going on with the drug. Okay. Uh, you know, 0.5% is a very high percentage if you consider many thousands of injections each year. So um, difficult to use a drug like this if you do a lot of injections and you know already starting that you will have uh, a certain number of unhappy patients. Okay, thank you. And now my next question is to Dr. Regillo and Dr. Boya. Both of you, Dr. Regillo and Dr. Boya, you have used this drug. And uh, because, and after that, you know, I would like to know that, you know, once you knew and you came to know about the vasculitis events, means how concerned you are in terms of giving the drug. First, Dr. Regillo, please. Sure. Um I really, I, I do agree with all the comments made to date, uh, you know, it, in the symposium about when we would use it, how would we use it? Unfortunately, it's a very limited way. If you turn the clock back a year, um, I would have thought this drug would have been the new gold standard. Um, the data are uh, strong with regards to this drug uh, giving us better exudative control uh, with, um, with the OCT analyses that have been done to date and our own anecdotal, albeit limited experience. I only have a few patients on it. Um, patients that I did start on the medicine uh, was before we started to get some of these uh, adverse events coming to light in practice. Um, and the few patients I uh, started it on, I've kept on it and they've, I've let the patients of course be aware of these events and they chose to stay on it. They were seeing the benefit both in terms of um, uh, improved exudative control and, and better durability. So they're, in, they're enjoying the, uh, the benefits of, of the drug. Um, um, I'm of course concerned um, that this is unique to this drug in terms of the vaso-occlusive events. Um, it's not been seen with the other drugs, so it is a unique and significant, albeit uh, at a low incidence, um, a problem. Um, so I now use it very, very sparingly. And um, I think actually since probably the winter time frame of, uh, of this year, earlier this year, I actually have not started any uh, patients on it. Um, and uh, so um, I'm, I'm very cautious right now. And I'd like to see, of course, um, better, better, more useful information to, uh, to us to guide us as to what patients we could use it potentially in a, in a safer fashion. Identifying patients at risk, for example, might be the next step. Thank you, Dr. Rajo. Same question goes to Dr. Boyer. Well, I, you know, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I, we didn't start any of the patients on the drug because we do have good alternatives. But in patients who, as was pointed out by several people who did not get a good response that needed to be injected more frequently than every four weeks or, or at four weeks and never could be dried out, we did try it. And certainly the drug does dry better and does give you a little bit longer time frame, as um, Ursula pointed out. If you know, just as when a flibercept came out, and um, at Arvo there was probably twenty different uh, posters showing the better drying effect with no significant improvement of vision. So you have to weigh when you're going to start this drug um, if you're going to start it. But uh, just as Carl pointed out, I have not started any new patients on it because we have other good alternatives. I do offer it to people who I cannot dry out very well. I had one patient that I remember giving her drug every two weeks, a flibrocept every two weeks, not drying her out, giving her one brilocizumab and um, finding that about 80% uh, of the fluid was gone with one injection. So it is a very potent drug. I, I wish we had a better uh, idea of which patients are at greater risk. I don't know if that's gonna come down to looking at antibodies as has been pointed out, if, if that's a way of doing it or if this is a manufacturing process. It has taught me one thing, however, um, I now carefully look at each patient that is receiving this both in clinical trials as well as in the office and look for any signs of inflammation, which 
to be honest, with the other drugs, I haven't really, you know, spent a great deal of time. So I have not seen any of the complications yet, and we are treating a large number of patients in clinical trials, but even if they have a few cells, we'll hold back to treatment. Um, so I think that's made me much more aware of, of the possibility of looking for things that I would normally wouldn't look at, as Dr. Um, Albini pointed out. Sometimes the OCT can show inflammatory cells that you probably would miss otherwise, and that would be a key not to treat. Or retreat. Thank you, Dr. Boyer. I think Dr. Cooperman have some questions to Dr. Albini and Dr. Nguyen. Oh, thank you, Ashish. Uh, everybody's presentations are great. Uh, Quan, when I have a couple from your talk, I, uh, I have a couple questions, and then for you, Tom, as well. So given the incidence of the uh, anti-drug antibodies, 35 to 52% quan that you mentioned um, in the treatment of patients, is there a mechanism to pre-test patients? And is that the proper way to screen them? And what risk, if any, if they're ADA negative? Do we have any data on that? Were any of these bad occurrences in patients who did not have drug antibodies when they were treatment naive? Is there any data on that, you know, Quan? So those are great questions, Barry. Uh, certainly, this thought that it thought to come out when we have this uh, situation with we see the inflammation. So far, the antidote and the body can be performed, but only in select cases because not every lab can handle this. And it would be great if there would be to be a centralized lab where people who are about to start on this can be tested for it. And as you point out, it's not 100%, it's only about, well, to have 33 to 40 something percent of this aspect that will have just an antibody to be tested. And we definitely do not know about those other because it would have been great if for all the patients who have had the inflammation that we have this tested and that would have been wonderful, but we don't have that data. So certainly moving forward, um, it would be great. And colleague had mentioned about registration. So indeed, like Francesco was asking, indeed there are registration uh, requests right now that anytime one have one of these case to please register but what should be the next step also is that if you were to have just a case of inflammation, would you be willing to obtain fluid for pain serum from the patient eye, from the patient body in order to allow us to understand more? And that is something very critical uh, as we move forward because indeed there, this drug does have potential as all of us have seen, but at court and David is pointing out, there are also problem with this situation uh, that we need to worry about. The 0.5% that Tom uh, summarized so far, it's a number that we concerned that we should discuss with our patient. But to your point, Barry, definitely uh, we need to be able to understand further so that a year from now or two years from now, we will have more data than what we do at this moment. The efficacy certainly looks so promising. If there was a way, for example, if Novartis set up a way for us to send a blood sample uh, to them, to some centralizer of regional labs to be able to pre-test patients. And if there is a strong correlation between ADA positivity and risk, then those patients would be excluded. The other patients, though, half of the patients might be. It's a way to salvage the marketplace for them. Dr. Cooper, you uh, had the same question from Dr. Albany. You had the same question? Uh, no, I, the, for, for Tom, I had a different question. Um, the, what about the timing of the occurrence of the event? Do we know, I know, for example, a Bicapar, uh, has inflammation, but it was seemed to be happening in the first three or four injections. It never didn't get approved. Do we know anything about the timing of that, Tom, when this happens? And the 0.5% is after how many injections? Again, similarly, if patients were treated for years, is that, is that rate per patient going to go up from 0.5 to 1 to 2%? Do we know anything about the correlation between uh, events and how many injections, et cetera, Tom? That was in Hawk and Harrier. Uh, that 0.5% that number. Um, so uh, most of the patients that had these events were not treated again with brolicizumab. And most of the events occurred in the first, um, uh, in the first 18 months of the study. So um, our real world data is, is hard to tell when this happens because we started seeing it immediately and then the use went down precipitously. So we know that it can happen in the first couple injections. How often it happens later on is difficult to tell. What I can tell you is that looking um, uh, at the Hawk and Harrier data, there was, a, there was a cluster in the beginning. So the highest rate seems to be in the first six months, but then it's, there, there is a random spattering of patients throughout 
uh, the course of the study. So you can, I don't think you can get to a point where you can say um, we're home free, but the rate probably does go down after, after a certain while. Thank you, Dr. Sure. Lee. Subsequently, I have another follow-up question for you. Ms. Pro, uh, you know, we know that vascular is a real concern for all of us. Do you follow these patients differently than compared to the, what you are following with other antivirals? Follow-up protocol. That's, that's to me. Uh, yeah. I, I think I absolutely would. Um, and uh, I, I you know, follow the lead of what's been said, Carl and, and, and David. I have st uh, stopped, once all this came out, I figured that we're still learning a lot about this and I'm having my patients wait um, for treatment until we know more uh, and you know, until we figure out who the appropriate patients are. For example, I had a monocular patient that was one of the first patients I treated with this drug and she did fantastically with it. But then after I came back from Macula Society, I uh, took her off of it because of the uh, concerns that, that we've had. Um, but I, you know, I, I would uh, recommend, like David said, a very close evaluation of patients for inflammation, Fl uh, e uh, fluorescein angiography, I don't think needs to be done routinely, but if anything seems like there's any evidence of, of cells, of vitreous cells, or if the patient's complaining of anything, I would do a wide field fluorescein angiogram. So in that sense, I think being more aggressive, whether or not you need to I, you know, I remember in the early days of anti-VEGF, I think with, uh, uh, with Macugen, we used to bring in the patients a week after injection and examine all of them after they were injected, make sure they were. I don't know that that's needed in a, in a broad sense, but you may, wanna, you may wanna do things like maybe have your office staff call the patient and just be a little bit more, uh, follow those patients a little bit more closely than, than you would your, your typical Flibrocept injection. Thank you, Dr. Alvin. My next question is to Dr. Vishali and Dr. Kwan. So suppose if some patient develop IOI, do you have any kind of, you know, treatment strategies, you know, which we can say to all our viewers, you know, a broad strategy? You know, Ashish, IOI, anterior segment, inflammation in the vitreous, and we all know topical steroids and you may give local, and even if it is end of thelmitis, it honestly doesn't bother you because you can take the patient to OR, clear the vitreous, do everything. The problem is the occlusion and with the emboli, and you don't know the nature of the emboli, are these immune complexes, are these drug induced, you know. So I guess all of us would give steroids in one form or the other because that's something you can do. But that's it. Steroids, steroids, more steroids and see how the patient is progressing. Even if we are not sure the emboli are inflammatory, but since Kwan has already shown type three, type four hypersensitivity reaction, I would give steroids very early in the course of the disease and Kwan said to rule out other inflammations, but probably if it is happening in a patient who's received the injection and the presentation is so typical, I will not wait for the results of any other investigation and I would straight away treat it as broadicizumab induced inflammation, the occlusion part. Thank you, Dr. Kwan, the same question goes to you. Yes, so certainly uh, this is a new type of information that now make us all aware and step back and think a little bit. We have seen occasionally after injection, after treatment, some inflammatory cell in the anterior chamber, and we noted at anterior uveitis, anterior cell, and in the past we followed with tuber topical steroid. Nowadays, with this type of information, what we shared so far, and noticeably that many of the cases have been reported start out with just a little bit of cell in the AC and then progress quickly. I would say that if you are to use this drug now or any other drug, when you see some information like this, please move forward and proceed with full workup, especially with fluorescein angiography, as Dr. Bini had mentioned, because unless you have, you have done that, you will, may be able to uh, miss that thing and you will be delayed in treating that aspect from there. 
the workup that, that I mentioned, and Vishali uh, very nicely pointed out, in the early part of this understanding, when we just get back the information, we did not know because it was so new, so we recommended aspect. But as Vishali nicely pointed out, when it's so timely related to this, maybe we would be able to, to uh, go, do the workup we refuse to, but not necessarily wait for the result, except for one a potential thing, and that is some of our patients in this category are elderly. So giant cell arteritis, which can have similar type of information, should probably be at least checked and evaluated. Now to the point of uh, treatment. So I fully agree that very, very aggressive therapy has been reported. As you, I have seen uh, and also show you as well too, the two cases, the case that him and, and Sarah pointed, uh, published, in that case, they go very aggressively to put in a dexamethasone uh, implant right away, and that was able to reverse back the vision and, and return. The other case uh, did not show such improvement because only topical steroid was used initially to try to control it until later. I definitely would think that steroid, but I would even go as far that if you are to see significant amount of perivascular leakage on floor scene angiography, I would even venture to go as far at intravenous metoprednisolone to control this, or if we see it severe enough, we would even uh, employ one of the TNF inhibitor, for example, infliximab to try to control. Because time is of essence here, we do not have much time and you need to treat as aggressively as possible. Uh, is If we feel that's unlikely to be infectious, then let, in which case we don't hear, we should try to to control as fast as possible because otherwise, by the time that we realize and we agree on treatment, the vision potential is gone already. So aggressive, aggressive and very aggressive in treating this type of patient. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. Dr. Vaishali, you had a point to make. Can I just add, uh, the vasculitis that we see in infection is generally very mild. It's mostly in the periphery and that's non-occlusive. So I guess when we see the occlusive variety, it's kind of non-infective most of the times. And I agree with Kwan, we have to act very fast. Can I ask a quick question if there is a time? Yeah, please. Yeah, to Kwan and Tom, when you see anterior segment inflammation after injection, could it be precursor for the uh, uh, occlusive vasculitis? Would you be more aggressive in treating just some cells in the anterior chamber after the injection? I so, can take a stab at it. I, I, I think I, I would definitely not um, proceed with, with, I would give that patient an injection holiday for as long as, as you can. And I would treat aggressively with topical steroids. I, again, I would do a, a wide field fluorescein angiogram um, to make sure because we have seen cases um, and we on the SRC, we saw this within Hawk and Harrier where they started off with an anterior uveitis and then the next time they had a vitritis and then they had a vaso-occlusive event. So it can progress. It doesn't necessarily have to. A lot of the patients will just stay with an IOI like you have with the flibercept with anterior segment inflammation that goes away. But I would be very careful about re-injecting that patient, not do it unless it's absolutely necessary. And I would, I would err on the side of, of being aggressive with treatment, as was said. Thank you. So that is definitely possible, uh, for example, the case has been reported with Charlie, they all start out with the AC cell initially. And so right now, uh, we are participating like many of you on, on the line right now in the so-called the Merlin study, looking at the role of map in AMD, sort of like in a different way, uh, Nevaska and B. And so since this event occurred, when, and we just recently had, when the patient has some AC cell, so because of all this uh, alertness that we are now aware of, I proceed uh, to perform a flow scene angiography in that study visit. I, hold, I held off the treatment for that one. I brought the patient back two weeks later because I don't know whether they have progressed or anything. And then the next, the, uh, the week late, two weeks later after that, I also monitored the patient again for about you know, six or seven weeks or so uh, before I re-injected again. The matter of this is that the, is, uh, Tom has made about 0.5% to this thing, but the 
the, the key thing is to some of the subject in the study, they're doing so well. So even when we present them with this data, they still want to continue to be in the study and did, they did not want to voluntarily withdraw. So, so we present the data, the risk and benefit, they still want to continue. But we at clinician scientists, because of all the, the information in our head, we just have to, to take it to them and say, okay, we have done everything we can to make sure that we don't miss anything nowadays because of this information that we have. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. I have next question to Dr. Uh, Gillies, Dr. Ursula, and Dr. Bandalu. Are you have, having any kind of concern of GA progression, geographic atrophy progression, knowing that it is a power for molecules, you know, it has a strong anti vegf Dr. Gillies first. Unmute you're yourself, muted. Dr. Gillies. You're muted. Mark, you're muted. We had the same uh, concern with um, the flibicet. When that first came out, we thought it might cause more atrophy because it was said to be stronger. And we did the rival study and we didn't find it. I think uh, in routine practice, we'll be treating and extending. And so you can probably, when you get to whatever the extension will be, let's hope it's going to be average 12 weeks. Then you might tolerate a bit of subretinal fluid then just like we do on a smaller interval with... Um, with the other drugs. I think that's the way we'll be handling patients. We, we tend to tolerate subretinal fluid here. It'll just be a longer interval. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gillies. Dr. Ursula, same question goes to you. So we can clearly see that subretinal fluid and sub-RPE flu fluid resolves much better with BOVU. And that is definitely an advantage because if you correlate vision with fluid, particularly with subretinal fluid, you can clearly see that vision improves even if you resolve subretinal fluid continuously. So because the, there's still this controversial discussion on whether subretinal fluid is good or bad, should you treat it, should you not treat it, in the Hawk and Harrier data and in other studies that we analyze, subretinal fluid resolution comes with a benefit. Sub-RPE fluid, I think, is another cup of coffee which may be equally relevant because this is where the CNV is located. It originates from underneath the RPE. And if we flatten and dry out the PED, the vascular fibrovascular PED more, that may be a sign of bringing the lesion to more inactivity. And I think that this is reflected in the second year data and probably would be in year th three and four, that the CNV is shrinking and responding. And this is why less recurrent leakage activity is seen. Thank you, Dr. Osman. Dr. Bandalo, are you concerned about the GA progression in knowing the uh, you know, strong anti vegf molecule? Uh, you know, Mark and Ursula have said everything. It's really difficult to say something more after them. Uh, what I can add is that anyway, uh, clinically, I am always uh, much more concerned about fluid more than atrophy. Maybe this is because uh, chronologically, you have to face first a fluid and atrophy will come later. But anyway, I am usually motivated to try to have reabsorption of fluid. For sure, I can tolerate some fluid because we have learned that some of them is not so, so bad for, for our patients. But anyway, my first motivation is to eliminate fluid. So only after time, you can have some atrophy, but this is uh, a problem for uh, something else, not for me. Okay, so to summarize, we all are on the same page that uh, we are. We don't mind, you know, we are not concerned about the GA. Dr. Cooperman, means Abisipa could not get a free approval. Problem was inflammation. Means I could not understand whether the inflammation had a different kind that, you know, Brolicism map had. Well, it's a good question. I was going to ask that of Quan and Tom as well, because I know, Quan, you have emphasized the anti-drug antibodies, whereas Abicapar, at least Allergan, felt that it was due to the manufacturing process. They felt that when they went from the Cedar and Sequoia drug, that is that manufacturing process, the data there had very high rates of inflammation, though relatively low rates of occlusive disease, and that seemed, um, or vasculitis rather, that seemed not to be occlusive. 
But then when they went to the maple study, they improved their host cell impurities, host cell proteins. They attributed it to that rather than, rather than anti-drug antibodies. So in a certain sense, I was almost going to turn the question around and ask Juan and Tom whether, given the high rate of anti-drug antibodies with uh, brolocizumab that I think surprised us all when it came out, that, that some of that information came out on the label, is, is there a host, is there a manufacturing process maybe possible in brolocizumab as well besides the anti-drug antibodies? And conversely, does Allergan have it wrong? Is it, is it anti-drug antibodies more than their manufacturing process? So I'm kind of curious what the two of you or anybody else has to say about it. Uh, but I do think it's interesting that the two companies are pointing to two different processes. And it's worth noting that as a side note, these are two fascinating companies because they both came out of the same lab in University of Zurich uh, and then set up and competing in the same building in Zurich in a high tech uh, biotech building. The two companies were on different floors of the same building and, you know, Esbatech and um, I like their partners spawn these two compounds. It's rather fascinating. Spawn and science. Uh, and Vinny, do you have answer to that? Can, can uh, I add something to this question? Yeah, please, Dr. Bernardo, please go ahead. Yes, as an alternative, uh, Vishali and Quan, could be the size of the, of the molecule, the very small size, in some way responsible for these kind of reactions? Well, the, the size is indeed small, but they also pack a lot of it into it as well, too. I, so far, we, the, the antibody, to, and the drug antibody, this and so far, at least in the literature, has not shown to be dependent on the molecule or the size yet, so far that I'm aware of, of this aspect. Uh, Barry asked the question of whether the manufacturer, I'm quite certain that uh, the colleague at Novartis are most likely right now looking at that to see if they have a different manufacturer to come in out that would reproduce this. I think that some of these are uh, a little bit different though because this type of antidrug in the body, some of them are uh, found in patient pre-treatment as well too. So at time though, some patient may be at risk for getting this thing. So it's obviously not the drug that causing the problem across all the patient because otherwise we would see a much higher. But I also I believe that the patient themselves, some of them just like they are predisposed to certain type of inflammation. Now they predispose to certain type of drug here. That's how we have drugs allergies in the way of this aspect. And the question would be how far should we evaluate the individual patient before we start treating them uh, with some of this aspect in here. Just like, for example, some of the patients uh, have very high allergic reaction to um, of some of the NSAID and lead to Stephen Johnson. And so in country like Taiwan now, for example, before they start patient on like that, they test the patient because now there's mechanism to detect for like that. So I think if this would do for you, this is what we have to end up doing. The, 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 Truly the challenges and the thing that we're thinking of right now is that as everyone has pointed out, we do have other treatments. So in the way we put this aside and we try to use other treatment in place of this because if, but if this were the only treatment available, then certainly we would have done everything we would do and continue to do, which we still do anyway, to try to answer this. Tom, do you have any? Uh, thank you, Dr. Kwan. I think, uh, do, uh, we, do Dr. Vishali and Dr. Alvini has some point? We have some, a lot of questions from the audience. If you want to make a quick quick comment, I see. Yes. We agree. So, yeah, Doctor, the uh, next question from the audience goes to Doctor Gillies and Doctor David Boyer and Doctor Regillo. Do you uh, see the possibility of uh, four months? That means sixteen weeks extension with uh, something like you know treat and extend the strategy. Uh, unmute yourself, Doctor Mark. Dr. Mark, you're going to... The video view, uh, yes, the proportion of patients I would expect would get to 16 weeks. Okay. Uh, you'll find out. It, it, we'll do a treat and extend uh, just the way we use the other drugs. We expect to get out longer. I don't expect everyone will get out that far, but I think um, uh, a lot of people will, and probably more than currently do, almost certainly more than currently do. Dr. Regina. Maybe longer than that. Dr. I agree with Mark, absolutely. I didn't get Even with that. our current drugs, I pushed a Flibercept uh, in a uh, small in prospective a... study to 16 weeks and had, you know, 8, 12% get out there. You know, some of these patients, 
technically may may do well even off drug. Uh, we don't know which ones those are, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I think Mark is right. We're going to shift the distribution uh, curve uh, to the right and probably increase the proportion of patients that are successfully controlled uh, at uh, 14 or 16 weeks. Dr. Boyer, on the same question. I, I agree. I think that there will be a, a percentage of patients that you'll be able to extend out to 16 uh, weeks or more. Um, you know, I also do treat and extend. So it's, it's going to be a question of the long follow-up on these patients and which patients that we should, you know, try to extend out that long and, and what they look like. Dr. Ursula, I think you have a lot of work on fluid, so I think it would be appropriate to ask you also this question. 16 weeks, something like that, can we have an extension? I think that this will be a matter of the individual disease activity, and we know that some patients, even during the treat and extend studies, at the end just needed one or two injections per year, and that was with drugs that were less efficient. So I assume that it's the usual like around 15% of patients that need only these one or two injections, and maybe as Mark said, even less. And I think that we should also get more interested in the fibrovascular PED, which is like mirroring the morphology of the CNV and see whether uh, drying out of this primary site of the lesion would help us in getting out of the continuous recurrence of disease activity. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Question to all the UVI experts, Dr. Tom, Dr. Vishali, and Dr. Kwan. Uh, uh, one of the you know candidate, one of the, our audience, he he's asking whether is it a good idea to start these patients on a pre-op uh, Pretford or something, and then just uh, you know whether that is a good idea to start them on a pre-op Pretford. Dr. Um, you know, if it is going to be such a severe inflammation where you have anti-drug antibodies causing the arterial occlusion and all, it may, it may not be really protecting it to that extent, though it can be tried. I, I don't have this experience. Dr. Tom. So. Uh, I've, this question has come up uh, at, at very, in some of these groups, um, we've been talking about it. And the overall consensus was uh, very much in line with uh, what was just said in that we didn't have, we don't think we have sufficient data to that, it, that of its efficacy to warrant the potential side effects. Um, so that wasn't suggested. I mean, how dangerous is putting somebody on topical Pred Forte? Not, not very dangerous. So I don't think it's a totally unreasonable solution there, but it may be more treating the physician than treating the patient. Dr. So I think I, de I definitely don't necessarily agree that we should start this because the, the incident is still small. And by starting and putting all the patient in this, eventually we may create problem. If we're gonna start using, I would go to even stronger than that to not just pronounce on acetate, but go to, uh, Lipofretinate, for example, to be strong, but then recognizing the type of problem that we see here is that it's not the entire segment, it's more of the vaso-occlusive disease that we worry about. And with this type of thing, as we know, topical steroid would not do any, necessarily any good to this aspect. So uh, by just preventing fuel cell, it doesn't mean that we exclude this because in some of the cases, they don't see anterior cell, but they see vitreous cells and then lead to the vaso occlusive thing. So I would not stop patient on this aspect at all because then you will be putting all of your patient with that. Um, what is interesting also notice is that I, I, Tom and others have also reported that after you get this um, reaction up to prolosumab, you stop it, that's fair. But then you start treating patient with another endovetra to control and then you get inflammation after that and the vet job, even though you did not get it before. Now that's where the headache that we're facing right now. And we've seen some reports submitted to the journal already, and we've seen other people begin to talk about it. And I think that that's what some of the headache that we are trying to determine when to expect what reaction, and therefore should we even start anybody on this, putting them at uh, subsequent risk or not. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. 
uh, I have a question to Dr. Tom. Uh, uh, Dr. Kwan, you mentioned in your uh, slides that you know you, we need to wait till the inflammation is all gone before you know continuing your treatment with the neovascular AMD. So, Dr. Tom, means would you have a preference to shift these patients like Avastin, Lucentis, or Ilia in terms, you know, knowing that some of the uh, you know, post uh, these uh, insurance studies, they have shown that aflibercept had little more inflammation compared to the ranibizumab. Do you have any preference to any out of these three? I don't think we know, have sufficient data to really drive that decision. Um, so I, I don't know. I've seen patients started on ranibizumab. I've seen patients started on aflibercept after these reactions. Uh, as Quan mentioned, I have seen this uh, reaction where you have progressive inflammation and vasculitis after an alternative agent is then used, unfortunately. So I think right now we just we just don't don't know enough how to drive that. I, I would say again what I said before was I would not treat at all unless absolutely necessary. And if it's absolutely necessary, then you know, go. If the patient had been on another agent and was doing well on that agent, that would probably drive my decision. And you have, uh, Dr. Tom, again, you know, you have studied the data of this, you know, again, with the SRC, you know, reading all those uh, images. How was the recovery in these vasculitis patients overall? It all depended on where the occlusive event was. So if the occlusive event was out in the periphery, which we saw in a number of patients, they did fine, you know. Uh, many of them gained vision. Uh, in the study, um, if the occlusive event was in the in the macula, then it was it was usually a problem, and 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 uh, a majority of them uh, did not recover vision. Thank you, Doctor. Just Rachel, if I could just interrupt briefly, I'd like to. Say, I unfortunately have a, my departmental conference starts last in a few minutes. I, I have, have to leave. So can I have last question? Okay, but all right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I mean, do you think you know we have some of the biosimilars of? Uh, Lucentis and the aflibercept, they are almost on the verge of approval. So do you think that would undermine the usage because of rolicizumab because they might be available at a cheaper price? I mean, the, the price characteristics are gonna be important in certain parts of the world. Uh, and certainly, of course, the, advan the price advantage of bevacizumab of Aston in the United States has been overwhelming. It's still the most popular drug there because we're allowed to go offline, um, off uh, label rather. Um, I think given, given this reality of brolocizumab and the complications, we think that this is a better agent. So for example, a flibercept was perceived as a better agent and despite the presence of Avastin at a very much lower price, a flibercept became very popular, not as popular as bevacizumab due to the price characteristics. So the whole issue of biosimilars, what it will do to the marketplace, what it will do, and I think it's gonna be highly regional in terms of what it would do in the United States, which is the largest market in the world, will be different than what it'll do in other countries. And I think it's going to be a matter of, uh, as has been highlighted, I think, by Ursula and others that, um, and Mark, et, et cetera, that this is a product that works very well, better perhaps, and certainly as Carl shown, and again, others, that it dries better than others. So it's going to be, I think the characteristics, the thought process will be different. It's the safety that's going to drive it. But if there had been no safety issues, let's play that thought game for a moment. If it was, if there was not a safety concern, I still think that this compound, Bovisizumab, would would sort of, as the saying goes, would do to uh, Flibercep what a Flibercep did to Ranibizumab in the United States. It would become so the now, drug of choice. Thank you. I have the last two questions uh, of the symposium. So this is an interesting question. Dr. Cooper, if you can stay for last two questions also. So my question is to Dr. Regillo and Dr. Boyer. Very interesting question. If you have to use this drug in a treatment naive patients, being a loading monthly dose, are you okay to give all three doses monthly, you know, given the concerns of vasculitis, or you would just give one injection and wait for maybe eight weeks or 12 weeks and see whether any adverse event appears. And probably in the meanwhile, to complete the loading, you would use another agent. I hope you got it what I'm trying to ask. I'll, I'll take that for a second. Um, when I do my treat and extend using a flibercept or ranibizumab or whatever, um, usually I give the one injection. I haven't come back in four weeks, but I start extending at that point. So in other words, I would give one injection four weeks later, another one, then six weeks if they're dry. 
So I start to extend almost immediately. I don't think we need loading doses. I, I don't know, I don't have the experience that you pointed out of giving one injection and then following them until they need another injection, sort of a PRN. I'm always worried about a PRN dosing because two days after I see him, you know, I'd have to follow him almost every two weeks to be able to really get an idea of when I need that second injection. But I start to extend almost immediately. Dr. Reggio. Yeah, exactly the same. Um, just as what David said and Mark said, I'm gonna use this drug um, if I'm gonna use it exactly like I use the other drugs in a treat and extend fashion. And I'll extending as soon, I'll start to extend as soon as the macula is as good as I think it's gonna be. Um, ideally dry. So I do the same thing as David just mentioned. Um, and I wouldn't really do anything different other than uh, every time the patient comes in, I'll probably scrutinize um, by a slit lamp, uh, signs of inflammation. I'll be, I'll be watching these patients closer, obviously be counseling them uh, closer. And, um, and I like the suggestion that was brought up earlier with potentially even a, a phone call. We actually do uh, do phone calls just to make sure patients are doing well after injections, but uh, in this, with this drug in particular. Okay, we have come to the last question. That goes to, again, Dr. Albini. Dr. Albini, in that ASRS, you know, that uh, uh, paper which was published, uh, there was a finding of 20% of the cases who developed vasculitis, they had some kind of autoimmune disease, whether it's, uh, you know, Reynolds disease, multiple sclerosis. Would you focus in terms of the history and exclude these patients if you decide to give bralicizumab? Um, the short answer is yes, but there's, I think that there's still a need for a lot of information to come in. I, I maybe shouldn't have said yes, but there, there's some data that's coming out, uh, that I think, uh, we're going to see what risk factors are for this from other data that Novartis has that I can't really speak to, but when that comes out, I think that, um, I think that it's not, it's, it's a well-recognized phenomenon that patients with one autoimmune disease are more likely to have another autoimmune disease. And if we think that this is a hypersensitivity reaction, that makes sense. Um, I think that uh, we are still learning a lot about this, but I think we are gonna have information uh, to help us better make that decision. Uh, Thank you so very much all the people and all that uh, faculty members for staying my request for 15 minutes more than what we decided. And I think we can summarize that this is a drug with a good drying capability. However, IOI and the retinal vasculitis is a concern. So patient selection, careful monitoring is the key if you wish to incorporate in your practice. And uh, probably we will learn more and more, probably, you know, like patient profile, whom to exclude. So I cannot thank you enough, all the faculty members. Have a good night, good morning, and a special thanks to Dr. Gillies. <laughs> yes, it's so late, Mark. You did, you're a champ. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. Great job, Ashish. Great conference. Thank you. Great, great conference. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.